you're not one of those who thinks that mathematics is woven into the fabric of the universe? I, um, so the question of mathematics being the language of God, right? So to speak of the of sort of the blueprint of reality, right? There's no question that um, there are patterns in nature, they are repetitive, that can be described through mathematics in beautiful ways, right? I mean, you have not just symmetric patterns or almost symmetric patterns. I like to make that distinction because nothing mm. in nature is perfect. Um, and you have almost symmetric patterns. You have periodicity in the orbit of planets and things like that. Clearly, there is order, right? Yeah. But I think to just say that this sort of symmetry in nature is the hidden code, so to speak, you know, <laughs> that all you have to look for is that symmetry, is missing half of the story. What's the other half? The other half is the role of asymmetry in nature. Okay. You know, there is a lot of imbalance in nature, and it's really through the complementary roles of symmetry and asymmetry that nature creates. That a lot of stuff happens because of this imbalance between the two. What's that, give an example. Yes, I have lots of examples. Okay. <laughs> so one good example of that is in, in life, okay? okay? Uh, it turns out that proteins, which are made of chains of amino acids, yeah. like, like big molecules, right? And these amino acids, they are basically um, molecules. They have a carbon in the center, and then they have four sticks coming out of it. And it turns out that they come in two ways. They can be what we call left-handed and right-handed. Okay, and the, but just by the way they, they're in space, they look like, right? And, um, and it turns out that if you go and you synthesize a, an amino acid in the laboratory, that was Pasteur that discovered this, you get 50-50, 50% 50, 50 with the left-handed shape, 50% with the right-handed shape. When you look at the amino acids in all living creatures, okay, from a bacteria to a sequoia, they all come only in the left-handed huh. shape. So the right-handed shape just is not there. So there is a fundamental asymmetry between the two. And mm -hmm. without that asymmetry, the lock and key mechanism that proteins need to kind of fold and split and create, be part of reproduction, etc., wouldn't work, <laughs> right? And we do not know why this is true, okay? We just know it's true, it's, it's there. It's fundamental for life. So that's an asymmetry, which is very important, for example. How about matter and antimatter? Exactly. So there you go. You know, that's the good physics example. You know, that the fact that Dirac's equation uh, predicts that there should be as much matter as antimatter in the universe. And, you know, antimatter is nothing so esoteric that goes up instead of down or anything like that. It just means a particle that has an, an opposite electric charge but the same mass. So, for example, the electron, which is negatively charged, uh, has an antimatter particle called the positron, which is positively charged, right? So, in principle, they should come in equal amounts, right? But when you look out, you find out that there is no antimatter out there. Very, very, very little, right? And, and that's good because if there were as much matter as antimatter in the universe, we wouldn't be here. Nothing would be here. We'd have foot. Exactly, right? <laughs> because matter and antimatter, when they, they come together, right, they disintegrate into a puff of gamma rays, very high energy radiation. So if you find your anti person walking around, Avoid don't it. shake hands, <laughs> <laughs> right? And so that's the story. Um, and we do not know. I spent a long time uh, trying to understand that, you know, why, what sort of causal processes that may have happened early in the history of the universe would have biased one form over the other, right? And there are all sorts of ideas. None of them is very compelling right now. Okay. Hmm. Huh? So you That's need both, you know? And I think it's this yin and yang kind of thing. Yeah. You know, you can't just look at this reverential perfection symmetry as kind of the language of God when nature is showing you that you really need both to make sense of things but there there is some beauty to this combination between symmetry and broken symmetry i think so right i mean i have been proposing that there is what i call the aesthetic of the imperfect okay. you know that physics is a little old-fashioned in a way in thinking that is really the perfection that counts as truth right 
And the arts and music, they moved away from that in the early 20th century. And I think we're still stuck in it, you know. And I think that, of course, symmetry is fundamental. You cannot be a, a, you know, a, a serious scientist and physicist in particular without having deep respect and veneration for symmetry, you know. But symmetry is often an approximation to the real thing, you know. There's this joke, you know, about the physicist that looks at a cow, right, and he says, consider a spherical cow as, as the first, first order approximation to what a cow is, right? And it works yeah. quite well for many things, yeah. right? If you want to collide cows at high speed, that's a good approximation, <laughs> right? But, but it's not a good approximation if you want to, you know, kind of milk the cows yeah. and things like that. So, so, so do you think that when, we, let's say, if we understand biology better, that this aesthetic of symmetry won't be the right way of thinking about it? Yes, I think life is a great example of the importance of asymmetry, you know, okay. as, as, as we move on. I have another example, which is Marilyn Monroe. So Marilyn Monroe had that beautiful little mole, right? So imagine if she had two equidistant <laughs> moles, how ugly she would look. Yeah, yeah. So symmetry is not always beautiful, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. there is this breaking of symmetry. Yeah, I and, uh, and I think that we should embrace a combination of both.